And I just want to thank again people for coming. And if you haven't been to Triac before, thank you, thank you, thank you. And come back. Come back. This is a really special place. And K2, thank you. Thanks for being K2. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Paula Ash is a native Ohioan who came to Indiana in search of a flatter landscape. Her work has been published in the now sadly defunct online journal Deviant Minds. She has also been published in the Nexus Literary Magazine and the Indiana Science Fiction Anthology 2011 and the Indiana Crime Anthology 2012. She is a proud writer of dark genre fiction and is a professor at Ivy Tech Community College here in Fort Wayne. She lives with her wife and far too many pets in Northeast Indiana. She also takes up space on the internet at paulaash.wordpress.com. Paula Ash. Thank you, Susan. Um, so I, I first have to say that I uh, all the performances tonight were amazing, and uh, my very short uh, story. Um, is is going to come pretty much out of left field because we had a lot of very emotive uh, biographical um, work and this is just entirely fiction um, like in the, the bio it is uh, dark genre fiction but for those of you who actually are familiar with my work this is not as disturbing as normal so you're welcome <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, so, uh, this piece is called The Skin of Men, and uh, it was originally published in uh, Indiana Crime 2012, and it's both my first attempt at flash fiction, um, and it's also my first attempt at crime fiction. Half a mile ahead of me is an abandoned farm bathed in corrosive moonlight. The barn has long rotted away, leaving a dilapidated foundation surrounding a large patch of barren dirt. Beside it is a massive house, a once stately but now scabby Georgian with peeling paint and crumbling brickwork. Cutting across the snow are jagged footprints like bite marks puncturing pure white flesh. Beside them are black blots of blood. It was instinct alone that allowed me to get a shot off right after the crash, luck that sent it barreling into Vernon Moody's sky. Creeping closer, I lower my gun and sidestep my way toward the expanse. The crunch of snow beneath my boots is an avalanche and is preternatural quiet. If he is watching from one of those liquid black windows when I, cross, when I cross the threshold of trees, he'll send a slug straight for my aching skull. A chill slithers up my spine as if the whispering winter wind weren't cold enough. Only a few feet of shadow left. I duck behind a thick trunk and close my eyes. The gash in my forehead pulses in time to my frenetic heartbeat. An electric streak bisects the night, no doubt a bus, and a team of EMTs en route to the mangled metal hulks of mine and Moody's vehicles on the other side of the course. And Jamie, alone. I had to leave him there. I had to. He was already... Moody made sure of that. My throat tightens, starts to burn. I choke it down. Weep later, Steph. Weep with Daniel once this is done. But find that fucker first. If I don't catch him, he'll never be found. Moody's pathology is purely pragmatic. He finds, he kills, he eats. Holstering my gun, I carefully slide out from my filthy leather, leather jacket, covered with bits of, blo of bone, blood, glass, and gray matter. I let it fall into the snow, and a coppery and meaty smell fills my nostrils. I taste acidic bile and shudder. The scent is like fuel, a motionless spark, and I am engulfed in a blaze of memory. I learned of Burton Moody while following leads for another homicide case. Moody was the employer of our prime suspect, Kevin Humboldt. The interview itself revealed nothing about Humboldt, but everything about Moody. When I asked him to describe Humboldt's behavior around the time of the victim's death, he replied, They're moving bags of meat. As long as they work, why should I care how they behave? His affect was flat, his eyes lifeless, and, lifeless, and his breath beaded. The smell, carry and familiar, struck me like lightning. Even after Humboldt's confession, I continued watching the video. His routine was banal, his interests non-existent. He worked, he went home, he slept, and he worked. Jamie chided that I was becoming the kind of cop that other cops hated. I saw crime everywhere. But that wasn't true. 
I just knew too well what kind of beast Moody was. It was my unwavering fervor that convinced Jamie to leave the warm comforts of home for the cold confines of our car to spy on Moody. We'd only half finished our coffee before Moody suddenly left his office and opened one of the locked freezers near his workplace. I hadn't even noticed it before. But once opened, Jamie and I both noticed the gnawed human carcasses hanging from the ceiling. And then I realized why Moody's breath was so bad. We approached the plant ready to arrest him, but he heard us coming. By the time we caught up with him, he was speeding away in his sedan. In pursuit, I called for backup while Jamie drove. We had no idea where he was taking us until it was too late, until we rounded the sharp corner of a desolate, unfamiliar road and plowed straight into the rear end of Moody's car. My arm snapped when I tried to brace myself against the dashboard for impact. My head pounded as warmth blossomed on my forehead. In the fractured light of our cracked headlamp, Moody was climbing out of the car. Beside me, Jamie moaned and his eyes rolled behind closed eyelids. There was something reflective in Moody's hand. He raised it. I screamed. A flash. The world exploded in a haze of piercing pain and scalding scarlet mist. There were moments of panic dark. I woke up and checked on Jamie. I shouldn't have. My partner's face was gone. In its place was a gaping wound laced with bits of broken glass. Light bounced off of the shards as if dancing on the crystals of a crimson geode. What happened next I know only by putting the pieces together with what evidence I have. My damaged arm, the gore all over my clothes, and the footprints in the snow. Tamping down the memory, I grab the bottom of my sweater with my right hand and pull it as far as I can up to my shoulders. Gritting my teeth, I inhale and with my right hand pull my left arm straight forward. The scream that comes out of me is inhuman, curls into a howl, a cry, an invocation. Come. Tears sting like nettles as I pull off the sweater and stand and unhook my bra. The ice in the air flows through me and melts into my veins. I squat and unlace my boots, peel away my socks to stand barefoot in the snow. I slip out of my jeans and underwear. Child. Finally, I gingerly remove my silver wedding band and lay it atop the haphazard pile of clothing. Danny uttered no protest the last time I lost it, but I promised him it wouldn't happen again. I breathe the cold into my lungs, the old, earthy scent of trees, the crackling non-smell of snow, and Moody's rancid blood. Change. Exhaling, I charge headlong into the whispering moonlight. The delicate bones in my feet shatter beneath my weight. My skin becomes a loose cloak of lead dragging me further into the snow. My screams collide with the world in torturous cacophony. I fall. My skeleton splinters upon impact and I am engulfed by a pain so fathomless it stretches my atoms apart. I waver between the worlds and suddenly, I am I. My shadow stretches long across the snow. The house is mere yards away. Moody watches me from a first floor window. His horrified gaze moves across my pelt in laborious revulsion. He has seen my transformation. A flash of the liquid dark and the glass shatters. In the fiery flare, his mouth is set in a wide, triumphant grin. The bullet zings past my right ear in a heated trail and bursts the bark of a distant elm. I growl. My turn. Rushing along the side of the house, I reach the front porch where Moody's silhouette is mad dashing down the stone stairs. He screams and my stomach flips in delight. I push all my weight forward and stretch my body into the air. Moody turns around, his gun raised. My snout is so close I can smell the reek of him, putrefying meat and rank fear. His scream tears through the night until I clamp my maw around his neck. He collapses beneath me and the gun springs from his hand. I dig my teeth in, shake my fangs in the meat of his shoulder. Please, God. I rip my mouth from his flesh in a red arc. Babbling, he reaches a hand forward and claws through the snow. I settle a paw on his back and hold him still. The juncture of his neck and shoulder is a slow bubbling wound. I lick his blood from my mouth, suck bits of his flesh from between my teeth. Please, I don't want to die. I'm sorry I did those things. Please, please, whatever you are, please let me go. I won't do it again. I... Two barks. The same pitch I used to child my children when they were pups. Just like then, quiet. The sound of sirens grows closer. I look toward the forest, see spindly shadows jumping in the blue and red glare of emergency lights. Moody is still, lying in a black puddle, barely, barely breathing. They will find him. Perhaps they will revive him. Perhaps not. I trot back toward my cache of clothes and clothing and weapon. In the shadows, I shed my lunar grace and clean the blood from my face with snow. Returning to my bipedal form, the bruises and injuries reignite, slipping back into my clothes, exhausts me. I collapse at the place of the tree. Figures move toward me in the wavering dark. I can barely keep my eyes open. The figures shout and bark gibberish. Stephanie? My eyes snap open. 
His scent slices through me to my core. His face is tight with panic in the wash of moonlight. I breathe his name, Daniel. Setting his paramedic gear beside me, he leans down, pushes the hair from my face. Hey, baby, he says, smiling in relief. Hey, I whimper. Daniel glances around and whispers, I'm sorry we couldn't get here sooner, and I'm so sorry about Jamie. His eyes glow hard with smooth red. You got the bastard, didn't you? I nod as more figures join us. They are shouting in the vibration of booted feet pounding against the earth. Before leaving me to the other paramedics, Danny digs into a pocket and places a mint onto my tongue. Next time, save some for me, love. Half dazed, I grin at him. Sparks of pain erupt in my arm as I'm lifted and transferred to a stretcher. Above us, the night sky is bright with the splendor of the stars and our mother. I close my eyes and am blessed by the radiance.